love to explore nature. Some of my best friends are animals. <laughs> I'm Isabel Yamazaki. I love technology and inventions. Yep, I'm a geek. Hi, Giles. Hi, I'm Giles. Artificial intelligence at your service. Together, we're exploring how amazing discoveries in nature are helping us design brilliant new human inventions. New technology that will make our world a better, greener and more amazing place to live. <laughs> Today we find out which animal can help us bring water to the deserts. What was that? And what animal can help us improve jet propulsion technology? The answers will amaze you because, because they're, they're wild, wild but true. true. where there aren't any rivers and hardly any rain. How would you get water in a desert? Oh. Hey, Giles. A very valid question, Isabel. There's an estimated two billion people living in the world's arid regions. And as the Earth's population increases, the pressure on our precious water resources is growing. So, we need a way to find or create fresh water where there is none. Well, new technology may have the solution. Have a look at this. Whoa! What was that? <laughs> and knowing you, Giles, I bet there's already an animal that has the answers. You're spot on! So, that's our mission for today? Indeed. Find an animal on which to base the ultimate water-saving device, tell me what it is, and why it might be the solution. OK, I'll call Robert. Bye. Hey, Robert. We need to find an animal that could help us create the ultimate water-saving device. Really? OK. Interesting challenge. So did you get any clues? Yes. Have a look at this. What is that? Anyway, leave it with me. I'll get onto it right now. OK, see you soon. Bye. So what animal could help us design the ultimate water conserving device? Well, I think if we look at animals that live in hotter climates and need to conserve water more effectively, that's how we're going to find our answer. What about this guy? Koala is an Aboriginal word meaning no drink. Or what about him? Emus have really good digestive systems that can suck all the water out of their foods so that their dung is really dry. Hmm, what else? Lots of desert lizards and snakes don't need to drink at all. They get all of their water from their food. Wait a minute. What about the camel? This guy can take the largest drink of any animal. 30 gallons in 10 minutes. And after that, they're experts at conserving water. A lot of people think in their hump they have water that's stored there, but it's actually fat reserves. Well, the water is mostly stored in its blood and cells. And like most animals, it must lose a lot when it breathes out. You can feel her breath is actually really, really dry and cool. That gives me an idea. Hey, Robert. Hey, Isabel. I think I found the answer. Camels. Camels? Huh. Yeah, I just felt the breath of a camel and it was really, really cool, which is really different to our hot breath. So maybe that helps it conserve water. OK, <laughs> I'll look into it. Bye. Isabel, <laughs> this is no time for a tea break. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. I'm just trying to figure out how a camel's nose works, because somehow it's making its breath completely dry so that it doesn't waste any water. Uh, with a kettle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because our lungs are warm and damp, just like the insides of this kettle. And when we breathe out, that exhaled air is going to be warm and damp, just like steam. Ah, huh, yeah. So? Here is a cold tray straight out of the fridge. Let's see what happens when I put it over the steam. Ooh. Huh. I can see tiny little water droplets. Yeah. 
What about this tray? Oh, that's just been in an oven. It's really hot. I'll put this oven mitt on. Okay. I'll get it boiling. Right, let's try it out. Let's see. Hmm. Well, for this one, not much water was collected. Hmm. So there's definitely a right way and a wrong way to collect that exhaled damp air. Hmm. So you're telling me that the camel can do this with a cold tray up his nose? <laughs> no. Hi, guys. I'd like to say your choice of the camel is brilliant. And I'd like to say full steam ahead, but you're only partly right. Well, then, it looks like we noses nothing about noses. <laughs> well, you have discovered the principles of evaporation and condensation. Evaporation is when a liquid turns into a gas, while condensation is the opposite, when vapor condenses back into a liquid. And you are right. Camels exploit these principles in a very ingenious way to conserve water. As the camel breathes in hot, dry desert air, water molecules from inside the nose evaporate, making the sides of the nose cool. Then, as the camel breathes out, the warm, damp air from the lungs hits the now cool nose. When cooled, some of the water molecules reform back into liquid water in a process known as condensation. That's some very clever water conserving. Hmm. But maybe since our challenge today is all about better water conservation, maybe the shape of the camel's nose allows it to have enhanced evaporation and condensation. You knows what, Robert? You are right. The camel has another trick up its sleeve. I mean, nose. Take a look at this. The camel has an intricate network of bones inside its nose called turbinates. They're highly scrawled, sort of like a rolled up newspaper which means they've got a very large surface area. In fact, it's several thousand square centimetres. Oh, that is a big nose. So maybe having more surface area inside the camel's nose, it can have more water evaporation and condensation. Yeah, and what's more, with those narrow passageways, it'd be easier for the tiny water molecules to evaporate when they breathe in and then condense again when they breathe out. Let's test it. Here we have a foil cup that's representing a nose like ours. OK, so let's weigh how much this cup is. 3.40 grams. Yeah, so you can see here that we've got a beaker of hot water and you can actually see the steam coming off it. So I'll place this alfoil cup on top of it for the steam to collect. So when that steam rises up into the alfoil cup, condensation will form, right? Yeah, that's right. So, we're going to wait a while for the condensation to form and then come back. All right. Let's see how much it weighs now. OK. OK, so it is now 3.83 grams. So that means it has gained 0.43 grams yeah. with that steam. And that's because of the condensation inside the cup. OK, let's have a look. Wow, it's so wet inside. So, now let's test out this other nose. OK. Now, camels have a lot more surface area in their nose than we do. And we're going to simulate that extra surface area using this coil of foil. Here we go. So, with that coil, it weighs 6.98 grams. Yeah, so it's the same deal as before. We'll put it on top of the beaker of hot water for the condensation to form. OK, so now we wait. Yeah. <laughs> so let's weigh it now. OK. So now it weighs 8.08 grams. Whoa! Wow, so that's a difference of 1.1. That's a lot more than last time. Yeah, let's have a look. Oh, look how much more water is collected in the coil compared to before. Yeah. So that just proves that if you have more surface area in your nose, you can conserve more water. Great going, guys. You've demonstrated the camel's remarkable secret of water conservation. Now have a look at this. In one of the hottest and driest deserts in the world, they are creating fresh water and growing crops. Whoa, it's massive. And it's just as I thought. It's in the desert. Yes but it's called the Sahara Forest Project. Whoa! How does it work? First, it draws in salty water from the ocean. Inside huge greenhouses, this water runs over large walls of honeycombed cardboard, 
which act much like the turbinates in a camel's nose. The salt water evaporates from the cardboard and so the air inside the greenhouses becomes cool and humid, which is a great environment for growing crops. And this is the really brilliant thing. Rather than wasting the leftover salty water from the greenhouse, it is then used to cool giant electricity turbines that are powered by a vast array of solar mirrors. The electricity generated is then used to desalinate salty water into fresh water and to power homes and businesses in cities many kilometers away. And one of the scientists who helped design this amazing technology, Dr. Virginia Carlos, is waiting for you online. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Robert. Hello. So, we wondered if your project has anything to do with a camel's nose. The camel's nose is very close to our heart at the Sahara Forest Project because it uses the principle of evaporative cooling, which is exactly what we do in our saltwater-cooled greenhouses. And so, what's the most important part of the Sahara Forest Project? The really great thing about this design is that you don't just get fresh water out of it. When you evaporate water into the air, no matter how you do it, the air will always become cooler and more humid. It makes great growing conditions for the plants inside, so we can grow cucumbers or peppers or tomatoes, even in a very harsh desert. Really? In the middle of the desert? Are those cucumbers? Whoa! <laughs> and we get some fresh water out of it too. That's just so cool. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking to us, Dr. Corliss. Bye, kids. Bye! <laughs> The Sahara Forest Project is so cool because it creates water virtually out of thin air by using the one thing deserts have the most of. Sunshine. Solar power. Oh. Hi, Giles. Hey, Isabel. One of your favourite topics, right? Greening the planet, literally. And to think that all we had to do to find the solution to the problem was look up a camel's nose. <laughs> Cheers. And it may be lots of fun, but it actually uses up lots of fossil fuels to go this fast. It makes you wonder if jet propulsion can be improved. Isabel! <laughs> hey, Giles. Are you OK? No, I feel like I'm in a blender. Why are you doing this to me? I thought you'd like it. Anyway, you are right. Jet propulsion is an amazing form of propulsion. You and Robert should investigate an animal that is helping to improve this kind of technology. Hmm, that's an interesting challenge. Yep, and engineers and scientists are already working on it. Here's a clue. Ooh, Giles, that looks like something from space. But wait, there's more. This kind of jet propulsion might even assist with organ transplants and help save someone's life. Oh, that's so cool. Yes, I'll fill Robert in. OK, well, I think I'll shoot back to the lab. <laughs> Hang on. Ah. Hi, Giles. I have a new challenge for you. Find an animal that can help improve jet propulsion technology. Here's a clue. It's based on an animal that moves very efficiently through the water. That sounds like a really cool challenge. I'm on it right away. I'm pretty sure the ocean is full of efficient moving animals, but which one could be the most efficient? Marine creatures are fascinating. They have many different ways of getting around. Some have powerful tails and fins, like the sailfish. It can reach speeds of up to 110 kilometres per hour. Maybe the fastest animals are the most efficient. What about the manta ray? It undulates its pectoral fins to move through the water. Almost like they're gliding. That looks efficient. And some fish almost use their fins like legs. But Giles mentioned jet propulsion technology. So maybe it's an animal that uses its own form of jet propulsion. I know that squid and octopus use this when they want to move super fast. And jellyfish use it too, almost constantly. In fact, 
It looks like the jellyfish is not using much energy at all. Maybe the jellyfish could be the most efficient. I wonder what Isabel would think of the jellyfish. Hi, Robert. I'm pretty sure that the jellyfish is the animal that we're looking for. Jellyfish? I think its efficiency comes from that odd pumping motion that it uses to get around. I shall investigate. <laughs> Bye. So, jellyfish. Wow. Aren't they so beautiful? There are so many of them. I have to understand how they're moving through the water before we go any further. It says that jellyfish generate swimming movement through a system called jet propulsion. They suck in and expel water to generate forward thrust. But it looks so slow. Whoever saw a jellyfish motoring along? I'm a bit confused because Robert said that it was definitely the jellyfish. I better call him and tell him the news. Hang on there, Isabel. No need to call Robert. Scientists are always uncovering new things. And now some new secrets about the jellyfish have been discovered. So it is efficient propulsion. Yes, perhaps you should try using jet propulsion to move through the water. Cool. So it's time for an experiment. Thanks, Giles. Hey, Robert, I need you to meet me at the lake and bring a canoe. I'll see you soon. Bye. OK, so for my research, I found out that jellyfish use jet propulsion. So we're here to see how it works for ourselves. By getting back to shore using our own form of jet propulsion. OK, so how are we going to do that? Well, I've got these plastic bottles that have one-way valves. So water's going to get sucked in through this end and it's going to get expelled out through that end. Cool. I'll show you how it works. I will fill it up with water. Mm -hmm. So now it's filled up and let's see what happens when I squeeze it. All right. Ah, so is that jet propulsion? Yeah. OK, let's try it out. All right, Captain. <laughs> let's go. Oh. Pump, Robert. I'm pumping. <laughs> Propel faster. This is as fast as I can go. It's not working. Oh. We must be doing it a different way to how the jellyfish are doing it. Oh. Hi, Giles. Hey, Giles. Hi, guys. Interesting experiment, but I can see you are still in the slow lane. Why not look a bit more closely at the basic principle of jet propulsion using an air cannon? Here is what one looks like. Just pull and release the elastic air launcher, and air will be pushed out the other end. Well, Robert, it looks like we're paddling back to the lab. Yeah. <laughs> Attention, Isabel. Attention, Isabel. <laughs> OK, I think our air cannon is ready for testing. OK. Fire the cannon. Here we go. Go. Oh, nothing happened to the cups. I think we must be doing something wrong. Yeah, but I wonder what. Hey, I know what it is. It's the hole. Jellyfish aren't square. They're round. Yeah, so all we need to do is find something round that can fit in here. Oh, this will work. OK, the circular shape is in and it's ready to go. All right, let's try it out. And fire. Oh! Whoa, they all fell down. Oh, my goodness, having a circular shape really made a huge difference. So that must be the jellyfish's secret. Hey, I've got a cool way we can actually see what the air's doing. Fill the air cannon with smoke and you'll see the circular ring. You got there. You have just demonstrated a circular vortex. This is a really important clue as to how jellyfish move so efficiently. But the jellyfish also has another secret. Have a look at this. Not sure? Why don't you talk to Brad Gamble from the University of Texas, who might be able to help you. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Robert. Hi, Mr. Gamble. We're trying to understand why the jellyfish is so good at jet propulsion. We know that the circular vortex has something to do with it, but is there something else that's important? I think so. When jellyfish swim, they, they sort of squeeze their body, and we've known for a long time about this vortex ring, which is sort of this donut-shaped body of water that gets pushed out behind the animal. But it turns out they actually use a second vortex ring that happens when they relax their body and reopen. They actually, there's a second vortex that moves up underneath 
and gives them a second boost and it can actually travel an additional 30% each swimming cycle. 30%? That's huge! Thanks so much for talking to us, Mr. Gemmel. No problem. Bye, guys. Oh, yeah, I can see it now. The jellyfish seems to pause before it makes another pulse. Yes, the pause is what makes the jellyfish so efficient. It lets the second vortex roll underneath the jellyfish, pushing it forward. So that's the jellyfish's secret. That's why it's such a good choice. Yeah, it's almost like the jellyfish is taking a free ride on the vortex <laughs> rings. That's it. That's the secret of efficient jet propulsion. And researchers at Virginia Tech are now trying to make robots that mimic this type of propulsion. They have a small one and a big one. And it says here the Virginia Tech scientists plan for the power to come from harnessing hydrogen in water. And you have to see these spectacular bionic jellies from German company Festo. These alien-looking robots are completely autonomous. They're electrically powered and can operate as a team as well as individually. Giles, this is so cool! The age of the jellyfish is upon us. But I just remembered your question. How can a jellyfish help a man who needs an organ transplant? Well, what organ does the jellyfish pumping movement remind you of? The heart! It pumps just like a jellyfish. Correct. This research is in its early stages, but bioengineers at Caltech have grown muscle cells from a rat on a piece of silicon shaped like a jellyfish. They hope it can eventually help people with heart problems. It has the shape of a jellyfish, but genetically, it is a rat. That's so weird. Yeah, it's a jelly rat. <laughs> that is wild.